So I've been involved a great deal in discussions about literacy and reading, and incidentally, those two terms are banded about as if they mean the same thing. They don't. Um, and I often wonder um, why we don't discuss the most sort of basic issues about what we actually mean by sort of reading and, and why we particularly want children to read and whether actually it doesn't matter at all if they don't read. Um, I, I do a lot of traveling around the country. I get to meet a lot of people and I get fed up actually with the sort of the mothers who come up to me and tell me proudly with their little Josephine or Tommy has just finished reading The Lord of the Rings in a, in a foreign language and he's only seven years old. And I always want to say to them, Actually, you know, Dennis Nielsen was a very prolific reader when he was young, uh, the well-known serial killer. Look what happened to him. Um, so I'm not sure that I, I, I particularly like that. And I also meet a lot of parents, um, fathers in particular, who come up to me and say, you know, I'm really, really worried my children don't read. What am I going to do about it? And I remember, you know, I, I, their child might be a brilliant sportsman. They might be a great academic. They are help the poor. They do charity work. Uh, they've, they've just invented a computer, and they're worried because they don't read. Now, I want to say to, them, so say to them, you know, that doesn't make you a bad parent. In fact, I once went to a wonderful talk, uh, I think, called Dads and Lads, and the dad said just that to me. He said, look, I take my kid to football every weekend. I spend hours with him. I do this, I do that. I don't read with him. Does that make me a bad dad? Of course it doesn't. Um, so I don't really like reading as a vitamin. I don't see it as sort of vitamin A, B, C to make a child better. I hate reading as a sort of a medal earner, you know, just because your kids read their special. Incidentally, I should confess up that my boys, I sellotape them to a chair and I won't feed them till they read a book, but it doesn't work. Um, uh, and I really dislike some of the things that we get in the papers about girls reading more than boys, or do boys read as much as girls, which strikes me as one of the most absurd arguments we have in the 21st century, as if it matters if tall children read more than short ones, when really the question should we should be asking is, are about rich children and poor children, black children and white children, or children from any ethnic minority, children from the north, children from the south. And I think there, questions about reading become a great deal more pertinent. And also, one thing that we never, ever discuss in this sort of long, endless debate about reading is what should children, or anybody, adults for that matter, be reading? I mean, if you're reading Charles Dickens, does that make you better than somebody who is reading Hello! magazine? Um, where does actually the quality of reading actually kick in that it becomes worthwhile? And I shouldn't kick another writer or speak badly about another writer, but it's not going to stop me with the case of, for example, Dan Brown. Um, <laughs> now, Dan Brown is a carrier who has sold millions and millions and millions of books. This one included, for example, Dan Brown, Deception Point. But this is a man who also cannot even string three words together in a meaningful way, uh, which is a terrible thing to say, but it's so, he's so rich, I'm sure he won't care if a writer in London uh, knocks him. But just to give you an example of some reading, here is the first page of um, uh, Deception Point. Prologue. Death in this forsaken place could come in countless forms. Geologist Charles Brophy had endured the savage splendor of this terrain for years, and yet nothing could prepare him for a fate as barbarous and unnatural as the one about to befall him. As Brophy's four huskies pulled his sled of geologic sensing equipment across the tundra, the dog suddenly slowed, looking skyward. What is it, girls? Brophy asked, stepping off the sled. Beyond the gathering storm clouds, a twin motor transport helicopter arched in low, hugging the glacial peaks with military dexterity. Now, that is all complete rubbish. Um, it's nonsense. I mean, it, it doesn't work on all sorts of... Um, on all the level. I mean, you know, death could come in countless forms. Well, you could catch pneumonia, you could fall into a pool and drown, you could be beaten to death by penguins. Can anyone else think of a fourth? I'm not sure countless quite works. Savage splendor, X mark there, uh, cliché. Uh, how many people have in this room have ever looked skyward? I mean, how exactly do you do that? Do international geologists talk to their huskies by saying, oh, what is it, girls? Can you arch in low? Surely if you arch, you're going in high. Um, and a helicopter, a helicopter with military dexterity, uh, this is the first helicopter with fingers. Dexterity means the use of fingers. And so I ask you, you know, if a kid is reading Dan Brown, is he or she improving his life? And the point of all this is simply that I think we need to define our own message. Why read? And I'm going to just very quickly give you a few thoughts and a few answers to why I believe reading is important enough for me to be here today talking about it uh, with Michael. First, reading, I think, 
provides you with a sense of inquiry, who we are, where we come from, our place on this planet, you'll find it all in fiction. Two, reading is creative. It is a gymnasium for the mind. I always think that people are mistaken when they say that reading is a passive activity. It is not, and I keep saying this to kids when I visit schools, reading is actually an extraordinary exercise. Taking digits, black and white, ciphers on a page, and then turning that with your imagination into worlds, and then peopling those worlds with multitudes of characters, getting those characters to interact, to fight with each other, to have wars, whatever. That is an incredibly creative act. There is nothing passive or leisurely about reading. Reading provides empathy, how people think, how we connect with each other. If you really want to understand other human beings on this planet, um, you have, I think, to read and, and find fiction because that is where the psychology and the empathy is all laid out. Reading, of course, is a training ground. It, is, it helps you to become articulate. It gives you interview skills. There's a, a, a speech by a man called Krashen, who I'm sure many of you will know in this audience, Stephen Krashen, which I often quote, and I, I've got it in front of me here, and I'm very quickly going to read it, if I may. When children read for pleasure, when they get hooked on books, they acquire involuntarily and without conscious effort nearly all the so-called language skills many people are so concerned about. They will become adequate readers, acquire a large vocabulary, develop the ability to understand and use complex constructions, develop a good writing style and become good but not necessarily perfect spellers. Although free voluntary reading alone will not ensure attainments of the highest levels of literacy, it will at least ensure an acceptable level. Without it, I suspect that children simply do not have a chance. And finally, and the most important thing of all, which is so often forgotten in this discussion, is that reading is probably one of the greatest pleasures you can have, and you can have it for nothing, at least while libraries are still in existence. Readings provide the perfect escape. In my childhood, a childhood of private education, but one which was blighted by a great deal of unhappiness, by bullying, by a sense of fear, and a sense of inadequacy, it was opening books that, um, that first actually made me realize that I might in life amount to something. And to go back to Dear Dan Brown, the reason, of course, why at the end of the day I promote anybody reading this book and anything else by Dan Brown is for that very, very simple reason. Reading provides pleasure. This is reading at entry-level form. Start here, and maybe in a couple of years you'll be up there with Dickens and Dostoevsky, or maybe you'll be reading more Dan Brown. It doesn't matter. Reading is so much part of my life that I'm here simply because I want it to be part of young people's too. That's my introduction. Thank you. I'm afraid, I'll be honest, I don't really have an answer to that question. I can only speak from personal experience to say that it was never a stress for me and that maybe a little stress is not such a bad thing, although probably you wouldn't agree with that. Uh, I was a very stupid child and I was very, very slow. I was introduced to reading by a series of books called Ant and Bee. Um, and the Ant and Bee books, which I'm not sure are probably current here, they're probably sort of, you know, I am showing my age in the answer to this question did introduce me to the sounds of words and to the formation of words, but above all, it introduced me to story. And I guess that is the answer to your question, actually, now that I've worked my way around to it, which is this, that if a child is immersed in story and character and enjoying the pleasure of what is happening in the book, rather than worrying about the lengths of the words and the grammatical constructions and whether it should be a semicolon or a full stop here, then I guess the stress will be much, much less, because they won't notice that they're actually reading until they do it. Sort of. Well, again, I'm, I'm not the expert in this, but again, from my own personal experience, reading is not something you have to rise up to. When you start reading, whether it's... And look, the first books I read were Tintin. I didn't read novels because when I was 13, I was too... No, no, when I was 10, I was basically too stupid to work my way through a novel. So what I found for myself was Tintin. Tintin is picture books with a certain amount of text in them, but I could enjoy the story and the characters without getting too bound up mm. in the language. And it seems to me that the answer lies in that. Absolutely. One has, which is not my field. I write books for kids aged nine up to about 15. But there must be books out there that do the same for children which are young. I think that when you get to the idea that a book has to be read, that a book has to be finished, you know, I always say to kids, if you're not enjoying a book, throw it away. Don't continue reading it. Find something you like. It's about finding your level and enjoying the story. It is not about rising to levels of stress and difficulty simply to please teacher, parent, or whoever. I have, I, everything I write, I'm aware of, of, of avoiding the obstacles. If I'm writing a sequence in an Alex Ryder story and I come upon a word with five syllables in it, for example, <laughs> or a complicated word or a word in a foreign language, 
Nine times out of ten, I will remove it from the world because my belief is, is that story is everything. And if you put a, a barrier in the way of a child who is reading, whether it is a six-year-old or a 16-year-old, then that is something for the child to stumble on, to feel inadequate about necessarily, to feel stressed, as the lady suggested, and that therefore they might put the book aside. And I am actually interested in them getting to the end and finding out how Alex kills the bad guy. Mm -hmm. So everything in the writing, the narrative flow, is where I begin with my writing because that is what will take a children on a child, or an adult for that matter, on the journey to the end on the last page. A absolutely. Right, let's just think about that question at the very beginning that you asked, uh, which is, what can you do to put children off reading, essentially, yes? <laughs> I didn't put that. No, 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 not you. No, no, the, 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 the one that's in front of us. How come uh, we have a system that puts children off reading? Not all of them, by any means, of course, but many children... Um, go through school who aren't passionate about reading. How could that possibly be when schooling is supposedly all about encouraging, teaching children to read and encouraging them to read? So what are we doing in schools, or maybe it's earlier, in nurseries and so on, that could possibly be doing that? And quite often we, we sort of ask the questions the wrong way around. We say, how can we encourage children to read? And I quite often think, no, what we do is we do a whole set of things which put them off. Um, so just to surprise you, I'm going to talk some politics. Um, <laughs> sitting on Michael Gove's desk a year ago were two different reports. One of them came from Lord Bew, and it was called an independent review. I'll put my cards on the table. I don't think there was anything independent about it at all. <laughs> also on the table was Moving English Forward that came from Ofsted. In both of these two final reports, not in the earlier models of them, but both in the final reports of both, there, were two, there was a recommendation in each. The recommendation in Ofsted was that every school should develop a policy on reading for enjoyment. It didn't say how that school should do it, but just that schools should sit down and figure out how can we help children read for pleasure, read for enjoyment. And I like the way that was expressed because it put the power in your hands and in parents' hands and in children's hands to figure out how you could do it. So though it might have come as a directive from government, if it had changed from a recommendation to a directive, it was no, by no means a directive on what you could do to do it. And obviously, the criterion for success of such a thing would be if it was working or not. If the children weren't reading for enjoyment, then it was a crap policy, and you could work that out yourselves as teachers in conjunction with parents and children, and then where schools were doing well with it, it was something that could be shared. So that came out of moving English forward. If I've got the date right, it was March uh, 2011. Um, a little bit later, Lord Bew's independent review came out in its final report with a recommendation that there should be uh, a test at the end of year six, or in May, year six, key stage two, the test that we now know as the SPAG test, spelling, punctuation, and grammar. If you look at the Lord Bew Independent Review, look closely at it on the DfE website, you'll see there was a progress report and a final report. If you look at the progress report, you'll see the personnel who, was, who were on that independent review, and when you look at that, you might have some doubts about how independent it was. I've also heard from various sources that when people work on these reviews that, and uh, commissions that you're confronted with, is that they're nearly, nearly always written by civil servants anyway. If you look closely at the way in which that review is constructed, you'll see that in the section on assessment and accountability, there are hundreds of references and research evidence. But when it comes to the section on writing and reading, there are none. Absolutely none. So the recommendation that those of you who teach Key Stage 2 and those of you who suffer the consequences of it in Key Stage 3 and 4, that policy that comes in this coming May has been presented into schools with no evidence whatsoever, and mysteriously, there's no mention of it in the uh, progress report. It only appears suddenly, three months later, in the final report. So Michael Gove had those two things on his table. One, 
an open recommendation that could be turned into a policy for every school to develop their own policies on encouraging children to read. So the school could be a hub, if you like, in a community, working in conjunction with libraries and any other agencies, and there's plenty of people experimenting with these, uh, most notably in Rotherham, but there are plenty of other places, with how you can do that. That has never turned from anything else from a recommendation to a recommendation. That's all it is. A recommendation stays as a recommendation, even though it came from Ofsted, who could back it up with research from PISA, from PEARLS, and from an incredible piece of research from Mariah Evans at the University of Nevada on social mobility, where 70,000 children across 27 countries were looked at. Meanwhile, you have the SPAG test. The SPAG test is guaranteed to put children off reading. It almost has the guaranteed quality stamp on it. You will be filling your time in school going through grammar exercises that 9, 10, and 11-year-old 11 11 children will not understand. We know this from any piece of research that grammar for that age of child is almost completely incomprehensible. They can do the exercises, they can mouth what it is, they can repeat certain things, but because of the level of abstraction, it is too hard for about 95% of children. It's not a mystery. We don't teach children of that age calculus for the same reason. It's a double abstraction. You say that that word that says table is not about tables, it's a noun. I'll tell you something else about that noun. It's a subject. Already half of you have gone to sleep. <coughs> the children, 95% of them have gone to sleep because it was a double abstraction. If you load children of that age with double abstractions, which they've got to get right, you talked about stress. That's not stress, that is massive anxiety. The teachers will be anxious because they won't understand it either. That's not your fault. It's a very complex system. I don't understand it. Linguists don't understand it. It's all right. Grammar is an incredibly complex system. Just ask, ask any grammarian whether they agree that there is such a thing as a simple compound and complex sentence. And you will set two linguists together, and they will strip each other naked and battle till death. <laughs> they will not agree whether there is. You will have to teach that. Linguists themselves, who know about it, okay, unlike Mr. Gove, who doesn't know about it, all right, but you will have to teach it even though linguists themselves don't agree about it. That's what's going on, because it was a piece of nothing more really than propaganda. That, that this present government wanted to get in instead of SATs. They were ha happy to let go of the major plank of the Labour Party, which was to have those SATs and have all that stuff to do with writing and how you could test writing. So that's what bothers me. It's the straight politics of this. Simultaneously with this, we have these incredible agencies who promote the idea of reading for pleasure. You'll be able to list them. Book Trust, National Literacy Trust, Reading Agency, 10 years old today, and Volunteer Reading Help. I love these organizations. I work with them all the time. But every now and then, I scratch my head and I say, well, why are they, why, why are they NGOs? Why are they charities? What do we do? Where have we got to in the 21st century that something we know in the ways that Anthony described and many other ways have a fundamental power of transformation in every child's life? If you take that research from the University of Nevada, they know that even if you factor out the fact that the parents aren't educated, that the mere presence of books in the home will give those children, wherever they are in the world and whatever language they're speaking, another three years of schooling. Okay? We have that as hard rock evidence. There is a transformational power in reading for pleasure. Okay? You can look at Stephen Krashen's website, American researcher who's looked at every piece of research on reading uh, that has ever been, certainly in the English language and in some other languages at all. I spell his name, K-R-A-S-H-E-N, Stephen P-H, Stephen Krashen. Have a look at it. There is evidence galore, but instead we get this dogma without research, without evidence, that we know will put children, not the children from educated homes, not the children where parents are actively helping them, maybe not the children who are in regular contact with those wonderful voluntary organizations, but those others that all of you who teach, you know, you can identify them. They're the ones that the moment you start using an abstract word, they fall asleep, all right? The ones that you know that you certainly start actually talking about comparing and contrasting certain aspects of text, and so on, when you start pumping in closed-ended questions at kids because you've been asked to do this crap about retrieval and inference, okay? That is the dogma that came out of the National Literacy Strategy that is a complete nonsense. 
right? Because we know that in actual fact, the most powerful agency for retrieval and inference is not retrieval and inference themselves, but interpretation. And if you do open-ended interpretation, exactly of the kind that Anthony was talking about, the kind of thing where you read and you speculate, and you wonder and you have open-ended questions from you guys where you don't know the answers to the questions instead of the ones that you do, and you interpret, you can only interpret if you retrieve and infer. Right? So you use, so instead of this silly mechanistic building things up one step at a time, first of all, we'll learn retrieval. Bobby had a blue hat. What color was his hat? Blue. Well done. You've got a mark. It was, <laughs> it was raining. Why was he wearing the hat? Ah, right, because it was raining. Brilliant. And the kid who says because he supports Chelsea is wrong. <laughs> Why is he wrong? Because that wasn't the answer that the examiner has got down because he was supposed to say that he was wearing the hat because it was raining. But in fact, the kid who said it was Chelsea was using his mind and was interpreting and thinking. Wrong, hard luck. We haven't got time for thinking. Haven't got time. <laughs> but that kid who said Chelsea was interpreting, was, was retrieving and was inferring. That's how open-ended reading for pleasure works. You play, exactly as Anthony said. You play with this stuff. You engage with it. You engage with those ideas, and if you bung into place all this stuff, retrieval, inference, spelling, punctuation, and grammar exercises, either there won't be time for reading for enjoyment, or you foot them off anyway. Can, can I answer first? I would not only agree with you, I would totally whatever beyond agreeing is. I think what you're saying is 100% <laughs> correct. Uh, speaking from my own personal experience, I always say that I can tell the character and personality of a library in a school within 30 seconds of walking in mm. through the front door. But a school that has, as you say, a well-sourced libra library and a full-time uh, librarian is a totally different environment to a school which doesn't. And you can tell it in, the, in simple things, in the way the kids speak to you, in the pictures that are on the walls and the corridors, in just sort of the colour of people's skin and eyes, a, sort of, a sense of vitality. I didn't mean the colour in the sense black and white, I meant in terms of rosy glow is what I'm talking about here. Uh, I'm talking about the sort of those intangible qualities you find in young people, and I have always said that a, a well-stocked library is the beating heart of any good school. And I still stand by that, and it is my experience over and over again, and yet the facts are but in 2010, 30% of schools in this country, secondary schools, had their libraries cut. At the moment, I believe only one third of secondary schools in this country do have a full-time supervisory librarian in the school. And the librarian is the hero or heroine of any school, particularly if that person is connecting with all the different uh, areas in a school. For example, just because you like maths, you don't, or chemistry, let us say, doesn't necessarily mean you can't read fiction. And I would love to see librarians keeping other teachers in other classes informed of what the sort of books are that can be found within the school library. For example, Simon Mayo has just done a wonderful book called um, Itch, which is all about a boy who collects chemicals and the elements. And, uh, and it's an absolutely wonderful book for any child who wants, who's interested in science. At the same time, kids who are interested in sport might like to try the work of Mal Peet, who is a brilliant Walker Books writer, who writes books like Keeper and, and Penalty Striker, which are all books very, very well written about football. So I think that if you look on the library as being the very center of the web in the school, provided you've got a spider there in charge of it, and that's not a very good analogy, but still, <laughs> providing you've got somebody who is a professional and who is committed and has the funds to keep that library up to date, you are going to have a happy school. That's my belief. Any other questions? The lady, uh, just here. I was going to say something. Oh, say. I'm so sorry. You go for it. <laughs> Terrible chair. Um, people in education know that what Anthony said is 100% right. Now ask yourself the question again why isn't it statutory? It's ever so simple. It's ever so simple. Why isn't it statutory? Why isn't there a law that there should be a library in every school? It's, I mean, it's ever so simple. And with a librarian. With a li yes, of course, of course. But I mean, you know, it's, it's so obvious that there are other priorities going on. This is the point. Me, me and Anthony, and there's a whole team of people, and you, and the, all those charities that I described, we have been beating the drum about this 
since the Second World War. Okay? And now backing up everything that we're saying, believe you me, have a look at Geoffrey Treacy's Tales Out of School, 1948. People have been saying this stuff. They know it, all right? The ministers themselves would have come through all these ministers of this row of minister, ministers of education that we've had since 1948. They've all known it themselves because that's how they became educated. They did it. They read for pleasure and the rest of it. But at the end of the day, not a single one of them will pass the legislation to enable it to happen for every single child. There is a form of discrimination going on. This is the fundamental point. If you have a trained librarian in the library in every school, and that librarian, and with all the policies and things that we now know about inclusiveness and about how people are discriminated against on account of poverty, or indeed the color of their skin, all right, and we've known about that, and librarians, along with teachers, along with parents, along with all of us, have become more and more aware of it, then indeed you can reach every single child in the school with books, find out what interests them. Teachers with the best of intentions cannot have time to find out the latest stuff that's coming out, cannot necessarily be engaging in all the debates about books and comics and reading and graphic novels and whatever and all the different uh, nuances going on, cannot necessarily be able to put, find, the, find, a, find a way to the journals online or otherwise, hard copy. That's what you do if you put a library and a librarian in every school, or at least with small schools, to share the librarian. It's, it's perfectly possible. Okay. They keep making it voluntary. All that voluntary does is make sure that some children don't get it. That's what voluntary means. Okay? Whether you're talking about health, social services, or books in schools. All it is, it just means some kids don't get it. Okay? So that's what is going on at the moment. And it's criminal. Quite simple, criminal. It's discrimination. Can I just come back to just particularly about the initial reading issue? You'll know better than me that sitting in front of you is something stronger than a recommendation, but is not 100% statutory, which is that you should be teaching systematic synthetic phonics uh, for a certain amount of time a day, and that some of the uh, some of the systems demand that you should do this first, fast, and only, and that some head teachers are interpreting that, that you chuck out the picture books and that you should only use the phonics text. That is, with reception and year one children. There is no evidence in the world, in existence, that shows that if you do this, children will read for meaning when they're in year four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10, any faster, any better, than using what we used to call mixed methods. So this system that is coming in, which is costing hundreds of thousands, probably millions of pounds, subsidized by the government, with an enforced test that is statutory, namely the phonic screening check, which again has been brought in with no evidence and is already producing results that are utterly and entirely completely crazy. That's to say, good readers are failing it. More children are failing the phonics screening chest, chest uh, phonics screening check than actually will learn to read anyway, not using phonics. We know that 80% of children learn to read using mixed methods. Many more children are failing that check. And what is the remedy that's brought in for those children who fail? More phonics. There is no evidence that doing that will help them read more. No evidence whatsoever. You won't find it anywhere. All you will ever find is evidence that if you bung systematic synthetic phonics at children, guess what? They can do tests that are phonically arranged. In other words, they decode decodable texts. That's all they do. It's just self-serving. I believe the word solipsistic. All that happens is that they simply learn how to do that thing. But again, they learn to do to read phonically. You give them the words that are difficult, you give them new texts, new words that they haven't come across that is difficult to decipher in that particular kind of way, they can't do it, and anyway, it never engages with meaning. So the key issue is, what are we doing at that end in order to encourage and help children enjoy reading and enjoying reading for pleasure and exactly along the lines that we're talking about? The answer is not to be found in intensive, exclusive SSP, since 
systematic, synthetic, whichever way around you want it, or indeed any other phonic scheme. And also, and I'm afraid I'm going to say something here, I believe there is an element of, uh, I will use the word carefully, something highly inappropriate. That's to say, there is one person who sat in government, recommended that to happen, and benefits directly from the government money, okay, that is paid. One person who sat in government, advised for that phonics program, those phonics programs, has acted to say which one should be used, and benefits financially directly from it. You know I'm a parent governor. If I benefited in any way whatsoever from something that we spoke about, you know, if let's say somebody said, oh, I, I don't know, let's invite Michael Rosen into the school, and I seconded that, <laughs> and then took 500 quid, right? That would be corrupt. Okay? Or inappropriate. That is what's going on. This is, okay. So that, there is a problem at the heart of that, all right, at the why and how phonics, in the way that it is, I'm not against phonics, I've sat with my kids, all of my kids, and I have more than I know, all right? <laughs> I have sat with my kids and, sat, and, and worked, I'm quite happy to work phonically with them or with meaning or whatever, but if you just do SSP exclusively, and intensively, first, fast, and only. That's the phrase that they came up with, not me. That's the phrase. And some head teachers and some deputy heads have interpreted that. They've whooshed into uh, reception classes and year one classes and said, picture books, out. In order that you can spend your time on drilling for the phonic screening check, where you learn words out of context, and there are nonsense words, which the good readers correct. They see Strom and say, Aha, they got it wrong, it's Storm as you would as a good reader. The inference kind of here is, just, just to, to both of you, um, seems to be that the sort of children are almost becoming like these kind of political land slaughter, um, and, their, and their kind of futures are being dictated by people in government. Do you think there perhaps could be um, more of a policy of asking children, asking the students what they want, what would interest them, what would engage them? Because surely there's no more experts than children and young people about what they want. Anthony? I wouldn't ask children, I'd ask teachers. Um, to be honest with you, I think that the, 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 although I agree with everything that Michael is saying, I think there is a great danger in sitting back and looking at what politicians are doing about this and accepting that a lot of what they're doing is quite wrong and, as you just said, quite possibly corrupt, when actually it's the people at the coalface, it's the teachers, who have the ultimate power over whether a child is going to love or not love reading. Uh, and it seems to me that the one thing that it, I've always thought that teachers need more of is time. Uh, the one thing you don't seem to have in your lives, and I say, I say I don't know a great deal about it, is the time for reading for pleasure, time for reading out of the curriculum, time for reading as homework, time for just shared text and, 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 and enjoying books without having to do some of those terrible exercises that you were talking about. Um, and this, to me, is, is, is where it all begins. I have spent a lot <coughs> of my life trying to get government in any form, ministers, out of the whole reading discussion beyond the, uh, the need for more funding for books and libraries and for more time for teachers to enjoy uh, and children to enjoy reading together. And my experience of government, both the last Labour government and this present Conservative government, is that reading is always the stick that they wave to say that they care, the stick that they wave where nobody can disagree, every child should read sort of thing, where actually they never seem to follow those words with anything that looks remotely like action at all. Uh, I was part, as I think you were, Michael, last year of the, or not last year, some years ago, of what was called the Year of Reading, uh, which seemed to me a wholly hollow exercise in, in flim-flam, largely. I mean, it made me say, why not a decade of reading? Why not a century of reading? Why, why just one year? And some of the, I remember that... Um, Quite apart from the fact that being at Downing Street uh, with the Prime Minister at the time, it's the nearest I've ever come to seeing a fully grown politician deck a seven-year-old. Um, uh, <laughs> he lost his temper. Um, but I remember that the, um, at that time, the, the, the program for May was called Mind and Body, Reading and Learning at Work, the Knock-On Benefits of Reading. September, you are what you read, cultural, personal, and local identity. And I thought to myself, that's a good enough excuse for politicians never to get involved in the pleasure of reading. Indeed. That's why that recommendation from Ofsted was, in fact, a passing on. Passing on. 
They just put, said it. It could be a policy that you guys could then put into practice. Yeah. Um, but, it, but going back to what you said at the beginning, Michael, about sort of, you know, uh, that every school should have a policy to encourage children to read, does it matter, and I ask this naively, does it matter whether government agrees with that statement or not? Since yes. it's so self-evidently true, why can't teachers just have that anyway? Right, because teachers have to fulfil certain statutory requirements, and the statutory requirements occupy massive amounts of time and energy, just as you said. And unless you rack back on that and expand in the area that we're talking about, out, nothing will fundamentally change. That's why that the statutory stuff clamps you and pins you down. And even worse than that, it actually clamps the results. It's not widely known, but the reason for the GCSE fiasco that has just occurred was that the statistician who worked for the AQA and for Ofqual, for Ofqual okay, made the demand that those kids who got Ds, the reason why that they were regraded, they were norm-referenced, the absolute reason why was because they clamped those kids' results to their SATs results from four years, five years earlier. So the kind of clamping that is going on, that is statutory, that is going from reception with the phonics test, coming through to the SPAG test and through to a GCSE that is, is crudely, viciously norm-referenced, that's what's pinning teachers down and not enabling them to have this. So what I'm saying is when this, these two recommendations sat on Michael Gove's table, there's an absolute crystal clear example of how he went for one rather than the other, because it is about reading and writing, right? He went for one rather than the other, so the whole curriculum gets filled up. Those teachers teaching year five and six, you will be anxious. You will be worried. In actual fact, ironically, do you know the kids who are going to do well in it, don't you? They're the kids who are reading for pleasure, okay? I took my year seven daughter, I went and put her in front of that SPAG test that is up on the DFE website. She was taught very little grammar last year in year six, just a, just a little bit here and there. And I said, can you do that? The first thing she said when she saw uh, the passive active verb question, she said, what's passive and active verb? And I said, never mind that. Just see if you can do the question. She looked at it. There was the question, which she didn't understand. She saw then the, the example of the way to do the question. And then she derived the principle and answered the question. You can only do that if you're an experienced reader. That's what all that's happened with that SPAG test, statutory, is that the good readers, the kids who read for pleasure, will do it like a doddle. They'll know how to do it. So there, my daughter was a perfect example. You know, she's read uh, more books than I have. So, you know, it's, it's, that's what's going on. So it's a question. Yes, indeed, every teacher in this room, most teachers will go, yes, I would love to be doing that. But they've, they've, you know, the classroom teachers have got head teachers who are rushing into their rooms and saying, we've got the SPAG test. I don't see you drilling the kids. I don't see it. Where's it going on? They're rushing into the reception and year one classes and saying that's a bit too much sitting around reading and making bloody grottos for the bear in bear hunt. <laughs> OK, we want b b b bear but sp sp spelling, that's what we want, okay, all right, we haven't got time for that monkeying around, okay, that's, that's, it's, it's priorities and time and space, and they can only come from central government, okay, to allow you to have the time, but what governments never know how to do, even though they say they're going to, is to say, okay, over to you guys, they keep pretending they're doing that, they keep saying, okay, we love you teachers, we think you're brilliant, apart from all the crap ones, and then I tell you what, we're going to hand you the curriculum. Uh, well, actually, uh, no, because we've got this test and that test and this test and that test. And so the whole curriculum is suspended from these tests. And then they clamp the results to the, they clamp the grading to the results from the previous, previous one. They know what they're doing. They're not stupid. They absolutely know what they're doing. Okay? If you had every single person in every single school reading for pleasure, you know what they'd have? They would have more unemployed graduates. That's what they're worried about. They don't want education for everybody, right? What have they done? They've discouraged people from going to university. They've got a result already. That's what they've done. They've upped the fees. They're making A-levels harder. Someone was overhearing Michael Gove on a train the other day saying, do you think I could get this business of making the A-levels harder through? OK? Of course, that's what they want to do. When, there's, when capitalism expands, suddenly we're short of Enough, enough graduates. We want more graduates. When capitalism goes into a slump, suddenly we've got too many graduates. It's nothing to do with the state of our minds. And one of the greatest motors 
exactly as Anthony has described it. I mean, very unfairly, he's described himself as stupid at 10 and clever at 12. All right? I'm sure you were a bit better than that. I promise you, Anthony. But anyway, all right? But the point was, it was that it liberated and transformed him and enabled him in one form or another to, to succeed. All right? We know, fundamentally, from every single piece of testing or, or research, that if you've got active readers who are reading for pleasure and doing a lot of it, they will succeed. That is the panic going on in Western governments at the moment, that too many kids will succeed and will have an Arab Spring here. <laughs> That's what happened in Tunisia. There were graduates working in Starbucks. That's, that's, you know, it was the precariat, as Paul Mason calls it. That's what they're most worried about, is hundreds of thousands of graduates who've gone through, at whatever level, higher education, and there are no jobs. So the simple solution is fewer graduates. How do you do fewer graduates? You norm reference the exams, and you, you up the fees, and you make the exams harder. And you start, you start young. Get them failing young. That's the point. That's what the phonic screening check did. Fail them. What will the SPAG test do? It'll fail the kids who aren't reading. Ever so simple. I empathize with a lot of what you're saying. I mean, I was given hard times at our 16, and hard times it was indeed. Put me off Dickens until I was about 25, and then I fell in love with him all over again because somebody lent me great expectations. And I've always been very opposed to trying to force children to raise their barrier to, to read something because, again, because it's good for them, because it's Dickens, because it's sort of good literature. And I don't think that's the case at all. On the other side of what you're saying, I have to say that, it, that I slightly... She doesn't need my sympathy, but I slightly sympathize with the dilemma that J.K. Rowling must have had. I mean, my book... My book, that's just come out of Oblivion, has taken me 10 years to write. It's the fifth part in a series. Now, that means that quite a lot of the people who are reading it and who've waited for the fifth part in the installation, in the installments, rather, are now in their 20s. They started reading when they were 13, <laughs> but now they're 20. And when I sat down to write that book, I did have the problem of who am I actually writing this book for? And any of you who read the book uh, will find that it is a much, much more mature and complicated book in some ways, more demanding in terms of its themes, its philosophy, its politics, than my Alex Ryder books or whatever. Uh, but it had to be that way because I was so painfully aware that the child who'd started at age 13 had grown up with the book. The Alex Ryder books, too, become more complicated as they go on. I don't think there is a terrible problem in this. Children buying books who are young, but are buying books that are slightly too mature for them, I don't see as a major yeah, issue. It's not when they're buying books. Or borrowing or whatever. I just think there's some children who, are, who, who could be enjoying books. For some of them, I'm seeing, I'm seeing mm. quite, I know I'm, I'm not talking about typically, I'm seeing children who have the reading skills that reading is being killed for because they're trying to read books that mm. actually and not the right books for them. OK. The discussion that goes on in relation to children's books in this country is still in its infancy. And part of the problem is, is that when I turn up and I'm doing meetings, and when you're the, the, the in-service training that you do scarcely ever sits down and you talk for an hour about good books. Nice books, funny books, jokey books, comics, Who's, who's got Marvel comics? No, we, we don't have those conversations in education. Those conversations about children's literature are taking place in tiny little groups. They're taking place at the Federation of Children's Book Groups. They're taking place with the school library service. They're taking place, for that matter, on my MA that I teach around the corner, okay, in Birkbeck. Those conversations about what's nice and what's fun and what's good and why. Why, is, why does that book appear to... You know, why, why do children like that book? Or what, why, is it, why are there different responses to the same book? All these key questions, you know, where did, where did J.K. Rowling get her ideas from? Any of this kinds of open-ended discussion that we're used to doing with adult books, and you have nice radio programs about them, the one program on any part of the British media that was about children's books was a program that I happened to present called Treasure Islands. It was stopped. There is no public discussion about children's books in this country, in the mass media. There are some fantastic reviews, Guardian, Financial Times, Sunday Times, and so on, but there is no fundamental discussion about children's books. So your problem, which of course is a problem, maybe with one child or three children, and there'll be another teacher who will say another thing, 
because we don't have the level of discussion between teachers and teacher librarians that if you go to Australia and New Zealand, much, much more advanced because we're busy talking about the nuts and bolts and all that stuff that ministers keep talking about, okay? We're not talking about, hey, you know, when Anthony's books, I can, I can tell him now, he doesn't know what I'm about to say, okay? <laughs> My kids are lining up in the playground. Year five and year six, okay, last two years. There was like a scrum, Anthony, for your books. The children were saying, I want that book. No, you've got that book. I can give me that one. I want that one. They were fighting, okay, for the books. It went through, the, went through that school, but it was. It's no fault of the school, but that was because there was a group of kids who had got that, and it was working like contagion amongst them, but some kids, and I observed it, were not part of that discussion. So there was a group, let's say 10, 15 of them. What about, I always ask that question, what about the other 15? Mm -hmm. All right? That's the point, okay? And part of it is, is because that thing that was going on about Anthony's books was not slipping into the classroom where you could maybe spend an hour talking about Anthony's books and who likes them and why and what is in that book and does anyone know some other things that are a bit like it and what else could we read when, I'm sad to say, sorry, Anthony, we worked through your books and so on. There isn't time for that kind of a discussion. So when we say, well, Harry Potter, some of them are too hard, indeed, of course they are. But there isn't even time for that discussion more often than not. You know, how many schools are able to have a discussion with the children, have the time for every child, not just kids like my daughter? Or, but, I think, of course, but the point is, if you haven't got a statutory arrangement for libraries for every single child, all that happens is that the libraries, it works in the libraries where there's a librarian and not in the schools where it isn't. That's why it has to be policy. That's what I'm saying. You know, I'm a believer in policy, right? But one policy rather than another, but with an enormous amount of autonomy for people to work out, all right? That's what I fundamentally believe in. So it's a combination of enabling by government and by the grassroots to work it out through discussion. It's actually what I think about education policy as well. I think the terms of reference for the minister are completely wrong. But to come back to your business, of course there are kids who are put off reading because either a bit of parental pressure or teacher pressure. Well, it doesn't matter. Some pressure going, well, look, you read the first two Harry Potters. You ought to read some more. But if the discussion is going along, wide-ranging discussion about books, then that won't happen because the kid will go, well, actually, I'm going to move across from Harry Potter to Superman. That's fine, of course, it's absolutely great. And then I might zigzag back into Tintin, and then suddenly I might read Dostoevsky. You just don't know, right? Why not, all right? Or Gunter, Gunter Grass's um, Cat and Mouse, fantastic story for 15 and 60-year-olds to read. You know? But if the discussion's not going on because schools are not a place where that kind of open-ended thing, except where there are librarians, school librarians, and school libraries, of course, absolutely, of course, 100% agreed. But that's the problem. It's the level of discussion that's going on. Thank you. Um, I could have a couple more questions. Just, just as an aside, um, the, the, the kind of whole time issue and the, and the, the lack of discussion. Um, I don't know whether you're aware, and there's lots of teachers that corroborate this, but in actual, in schools at the moment, the time is so limited and the constraints of the things that you have to fulfill and criteria and policy, they're actually being told not to teach whole books and not to teach whole plays, to teach a section of a play. We recently, um, I recently taught um, Great Expectations, and we were told to teach the first two chapters and then just tell them what happens at the end. And the kids were gutted. So, you know, so it's not only just that there's a kind of limitation of reading. I love the right. idea of teaching the end of, the end of Great Expectations. Dickens himself didn't know what there the end two. of Great Expectations was. There are two. Yes, there are two <laughs> endings. He was sitting there going, which uh, so like that, I do feel we're listening to this session. It has been a bit gloomy, particularly because I know you had Michael Gove here this morning, so none of you are in a good mood. But, um, <laughs> but, um, but, but I do want to say that, I, I mean, Michael, yes, I take my... The fact that Treasure Island is no longer on, I've been a guest on that programme twice, I think, and yes. I've loved being it and loved listening to it, and it is a terrible thing that it's not on. But actually, I do want to say one thing, that we mustn't forget that we are living still in the golden age of children's literature, and that things have changed. Actually, since I was a boy, there are now so many more authors who are having a voice for young people, whether it's Captain Underpants or Cherubs or, or uh, you know, Artemis Fowler, all these characters that kids know about and talk about in playgrounds. That 10, 20 years ago, when I began writing, it was all old writers, dead writers, what our parents used to read. And thanks to JK and what happened after that, you, as teachers, are living surrounded by some of the best books we've ever had. And if there is one thing I want to draw from this conversation today, it would be this. 
this, that, you know, the government will continue to be idiots because that's what they are, and regulation, <laughs> I don't believe, Michael, will actually help one way or another. At the end of the day, I'm entirely down with that gentleman there, that what will happen must happen within your buildings, within your schools, and there is one fight you must win. It is more time for reading, more money for this man and his library, and for people to work like him, and to forget the rest of it, and you are the ones with the kids. You're the ones who can make the difference. That's what I believe. Fight for it. Yeah.